Um, today, uh, this is a recorded lecture of chapter 4A and 4B. Um, I'm not going to be doing a live lecture this week. I'm going to be out of town, so you guys can watch this whenever you like. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. If you have any questions about today's lecture, please email me. Remember to email me only to Canvas email, not to my regular email. Okay, so we're going to start with chapter 4A, Making Energy. I'm sorry, it's chapter 4B and chapter 4C. Okay, this is chapter 4B, biochemical pathways, basically how ATP is made. Okay, some energy basics. All living things require energy. They don't require food. Plants don't need food. Now, if you say, what about plant food? It's not really food. It's just nutrients they need to photosynthesize. So all living things require energy, not food. Animals get this energy by breaking the chemical bonds in food molecules, so animals always eat. There's one animal that can photosynthesize, but I may be talking about that later. Plants get the energy from the sun or, uh, or artificial lights. You can also give plants artificial light, and that will help them photosynthesize. Plants store energy from the sun in the form of chemical bonds, which is their tissue, the food that we eat or that animals eat, uh, and then we eat them. The process of converting sunlight into chemical bond energy, basically food, is called photosynthesis. And this is a summary of how it works. Sunlight comes into the leaf, carbon dioxide goes in, which is what we breathe out, and water goes in from the, from the soil. And out comes oxygen that we breathe, and sugar is the main product of photosynthesis. Okay, respiration. All living organisms must carry out respiration, everything from bacteria to us. Respiration is the breakdown of food molecules to produce ATP energy. That's what this whole lecture is all about. Even plants break down the food they store for energy. They do this at night or when, after the winter time when they don't have any leaves and they have to regrow their leaves from stored food in their roots. Why do plants make and store food? Well, they need it for some time when they can't photosynthesize. For example, at nighttime or after the winter, or to give to their offspring inside of seeds, or to feed animals that would help move their seeds. For example, bees and butterflies get fed uh, nectar from plants so that they will move the, uh, move the pollen. Organisms that make their own food from CO2, water, and sun are called autotrophs. This term auto means self, troph means feeder. So it means they feed themselves. Literally, it means they make their own food. One group of autotrophs are the plants. There are also some photosynthetic bacteria that we may touch, touch on later in the semester. Organisms that have to eat food to get energy are called heter heterotrophs. Hetero means other or other opposite. So they, uh, they're organisms that eat something else and they don't feed themselves. One group of heterotrophs are the animals, including us. Okay, the key is ATP. Although energy is stored in the bonds inside food molecules, this energy is not available to cells for work. So you can't use food directly to do things inside your cells. ATP is the form of energy that cells can use to do work. So the key is you have to take food and convert it into ATP, and that is called respiration. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Notice the prefix tri stands for three phosphates attached to a molecule of adenosine. When the ATP does work in the cell, one of the phosphates detaches or comes off and then turns the ATP into ADP, which is diphosphate, di meaning two. The other phosphate is still there, but it's no longer attached. Now, the way to think about it is ATP is like a charged up rechargeable battery, and ATP is a discharged or dead rechargeable battery. So ATP is useful, can do things. ADP is not until it gets recharged. When the food is broken down, the phosphate is reattached, as in a battery being re-energized. Energy is stored and ATP is ready to do cellular work. So really what respiration is, is breaking down food so that the phosphate can attach to the diphosphate and making it into triphosphate. And that is the charged up battery. Okay, the next figure. Now, this will not be on the test, but it's there to help you understand. So we're at the top here. We're looking at ATP. There's adenosine and there's the three phosphates attached. When you do work in the cell, such as exercise, you see that the phosphate has come off and what you have left is ADP. The phosphate is still there, it's just not attached to this molecule. Now, when you eat food, break it down inside your cells, 
that converts the ADP and phosphate back into ATP. This is not going to be an essay on the test. Okay, I will ask you to know what this equation is and to be able to write it, so you need to memorize it. Glucose plus oxygen turns into carbon dioxide, water, and ATP energy. A common fuel molecule for cellular respiration is glucose. Now, other kinds of food molecules can go through this process, but we'll be focusing on glucose as the main sugar. This is the overall equation for what happens to glucose during cellular respiration. Now note, down here we have a six in front of oxygen and a six in front of carbon dioxide and a six in front of water. These are called coefficients. You do not need to worry about them, but what, what that does is it ensures that if you count up all the hydrogens, oxygen, and carbons on the right, it'll equal all the carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens on the left. It's called a balanced equation. These coefficients are not important in terms of your understanding it. So if you don't see the sixes, that's okay. Don't panic. It's still the same equation. Okay, what is the chemistry beside behind breaking down sugar? The formula for glucose or sugar is C6H12O6. And we did this in lab. You remember putting this together in our atoms and molecules lab. When sugar is broken down, the energy in the molecules bonds are converted into ATP energy. That was that cycle that I showed you earlier. The byproducts of the reaction are CO2 and water. Now, CO2 has to be gotten rid of. We do this by breathing out. Water we keep. So we actually make a little bit of water inside of our bodies just by sitting around and burning sugar. This is the unbalanced chemical reaction, glucose plus oxygen that we breathe in, carbon dioxide that we breathe out with water. So if we were to take this equation and write it in words, you would say the sugar from your food plus the oxygen that you breathe is converted into, arrow, carbon dioxide that you breathe out, and water with ATP as the main product. The key is ATP. Now notice ATP is in parentheses here because it's not an actual product of the reaction, but it happens as a result of this reaction happening. And I'll show you how that works coming up in a second. Okay, the relationship between cellular respiration and breathing. Cellular respiration and breathing are closely related. You have to be able to do one before you do the other. And which came first? Cellular respiration came first, first because when we were embryos, we weren't breathing, but we were still respiring. We didn't start actually breathing until we were born. Cellular respiration requires a cell to exchange gases with its surroundings. Even bacteria and protists have to do this. Breathing exchanges these gases between the blood and outside air. So when we breathe out, CO2 leaves. When we breathe in, oxygen comes in. So this shows you how this works. This figure I do not think will be on the test, but it shows you oxygen coming in when we breathe in and it goes through the blood to your muscle cells. You do cellular respiration, which is burning sugar, making ATP and using the ATP. The byproduct of that are waste is CO2, which goes back through the veins of your body to your lungs and where it gets breathed out. And this is somebody exercising. Okay, now let's take a look at these four guys. There's two guys in the upper right and two guys in the upper left. Now, what I want to stress to you guys is the two guys in the upper left are resting and the two guys on the upper right are running as fast as they can. If you look at their expressions, you can see they're not jogging. They're not even in a marathon. They're sprinting. OK, so these guys are doing one form of cellular respiration. and These guys are doing a different. Anaerobic respiration occurs in the cytoplasm, which is what these guys on the right are doing, and does not require oxygen. It's called glycolysis. Glyco meaning sugar, lysis splitting. Now, even though these guys are breathing, they're not getting enough oxygen to do respiration. So they do anaerobic respiration. And means without, and aerobic means oxygen. So even though there's a little bit of oxygen in their body, it's not enough to keep up with their exercise levels. Now, when you're sprinting, even these guys have to stop pretty soon after they start, 10, 20, 30 seconds. At some point, you have to stop because anaerobic cannot last for very long. Sprinting is an anaerobic activity. These guys are sprinting. What's the upside of it? Well, you don't have to have oxygen. So even if you don't have enough oxygen, you can exercise or stay alive for a while. What's the downside? We only get two ATP molecules per sugar, and that's not a very good deal, but it's better than nothing. The other thing that you get as a downside is that lactic acid starts to build up. Now, if you've ever been sprinting, you start to feel the burn in your muscles and in your lungs. That is due to the accumulation of lactic acid. What that's telling you 
is that you've converted over to anaerobic respiration and you're gonna have to stop pretty soon. Pretty soon you're gonna have to slow down, stop sprinting or stop holding your breath. Aerobic is what the two guys on the left are doing. It occurs in the mitochondria and requires oxygen. You gotta have plenty of oxygen to do this. The two parts of respiration that require oxygen are the Krebs cycle and electron transport. We're gonna be starting talking about glycolysis, then we're gonna to go to Krebs cycle. We're gonna assume there's oxygen and the electron transport. Electron transport is where most of the ATP in the body is made. When you rest, you're burning sugar aerobically. So if you're watching this while not sprinting on a treadmill, you're sitting here watching me, you're doing what these two guys are doing, which is aerobic cellular respiration. What's the upside? Well, you get 32 ATP. That's a lot better um, amount of ATP per sugar. What's the problem? You've got to have plenty of oxygen to do it. So this guy looks like he just got done sprinting. So he went from anaerobic here to aerobic when he stopped. And these guys will have to switch back to aerobic as well. Okay, this is a illustration, not from your book, from a different book. This shows you glucose molecules. Now in the cytoplasm, the beginning of either step, aerobic or anaerobic, is called glycolysis. And you can see it breaks the six carbon glucose into two three carbon molecules called pyruvic acid. Now please note, pyruvic acid and pyruvate are the same thing. So whenever you see the sub suffix ic acid, ic acid, you can substitute the suffix ate. So pyruvic acid and pyruvate are the same thing. We're gonna see that down here. Lactic acid is the same thing as lactate. So if you ever see the term lactate, you're talking about lactic acid. Okay, so let's say you and I are sitting here nice and still, we're not sprinting, there's plenty of oxygen available. What do you make? You make 32 ATP, you're making water, you make carbon dioxide when you breathe out and you get plenty of ATP. But let's say you start sprinting limited oxygen. So instead of breaking the sugar all the way down and getting lots of ATP, you produce a thing called lactic acid. And that's where the burn comes from. Notice that you make a minimum amount of ATP, only two per glucose. It's enough to keep sprinting for a while, but not indefinitely. Okay, please note, see this term fermentation? That's the same thing as saying anaerobic respiration. So make a note in your notes, the fermentation and anaerobic respiration are the same thing. Now, muscle, human muscle cells have enough on-hand ATP to support activities such as a quick sprint for about five seconds. One of the things you should also know is that your body cannot store ATP. It has to be made fresh constantly. So we can't store lots of it. So we have to be making it all the time, fresh. So you have about five seconds. Can you sprint for longer than five seconds? Yes, you can but you use up the available ATP in about five to 10 seconds. So when you use up the ATP that you've made, if you're using it faster than you're making it, you use a secondary supply of energy called creatine phosphate. Some bodybuilders and other athletes take creatine uh, supplements to help them get more energy before they have to switch over to anaerobic. So this gets you another 10 seconds. Can you sprint for more than 10 seconds or 15 seconds? This is a total of 15. Yes, you can. So how do you keep going after about 15 to 20 seconds? Well, that's when you start to feel the burn. Now, if you keep running past this 15 to 20 seconds, you're going to start feeling the burn because you're switching now to anaerobic fermentation or anaerobic respiration. The product of lactic acid is fermentation in humans and other mammals. Now, what we're going to see is some organisms don't make lactic acid they make something a lot more fun to consume. And I'll explain what, you, what I mean by that. So you know you've switched to anaerobic respiration or fermentation when you feel the burn and that's the accumulation of lactic acid in your cells. Okay, so notice I put it in here, fermentation or anaerobic respiration in microorganisms. Some microorganisms do not produce lactic acid. Instead, for example, yeast cells, you guys have heard of yeast, it goes in beer, and wine, bread, they do it differently. This pathway produces carbon dioxide and ethyl alcohol. Now I said they make a much more fun byproduct. The CO2 is the bubbles that you find in beer or champagne and the ethyl alcohol is the booze portion of it. So if either one is missing, most people are not gonna wanna consume the beer, ethyl alcohol and CO2. Now, one of the reasons why 
you don't have to worry about live yeast in your beer, especially if you've made it at home, as the ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide poison the yeast cells and kill them eventually. So at a certain level, about three to 4% alcohol, the yeast die and the beer becomes stable and ready to drink. Okay, that was it for chapter 4B. So now we are going to go to chapter 4C. Okay, so we're gonna just keep going from what we were talking about, aerobic versus anaerobic respiration. Okay, this is a quick review of what we just did. I usually do this on a different day. So this is a review. Sugar molecules are broken down in order to produce ATP. This is what we talked about in the first part. ATP does all the cellular work in the body. So if you wanna flex a muscle or move something or build a, build a molecule, you gotta use ATP. There's two pathways for sugar molecules, either anaerobic, like with sprinting or holding your breath, and aerobic, which is resting. Anaerobic occurs in the cytoplasm. You can see it's this kind of grayish area between the organelles. Aerobic occurs in the mitochondria, which are shown here as kind of yellow beans. All right, this is an overview. This is not gonna be on the test. This is just to show you kind of how it works. Now we're outside the mitochondria is this big gray thing, but right now, the beginning, we're in glycolysis. You go from glucose to pyruvic acid, and you make a little bit of ATP. The other thing you know, I want you guys to keep your eye on is these high energy electrons that are carried by a molecule called NADH. This stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide with hydrogen, but you don't need to know that. Anyway, notice that this orange line is going all the way to electron transport or ETS. Notice the orange line from Krebs cycle is also going to ETS. You want to keep your eye open for that. The next stage is Krebs cycle. Notice that it's inside the mitochondria, which means that you have to have oxygen here. It makes a bit of ATP, but notice when we get all the way to the end, electron transport, we make a whole bunch of ATP. That's the whole point of electron transport. So doing this and this make these energy carriers and hydrogen carriers that are gonna to go to electron transport. Okay, glycolysis. Glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm between the organelles. The six carbon glucose is broken down into three carbon molecules called pyruvate. Remember I said pyruvate and pyruvic acid are the same thing. During this breakdown, two ATP molecules are produced and this is what you get from anaerobic respiration. Now the key is, what I wanted to show you guys is NADH are produced to carry hydrogens. I want you to think about those as kind of like wheelbarrows. Now what is the purpose of a wheelbarrow? Well, you fill it with something, you move it somewhere, and then you dump what it's holding and you go back and fill up for more. So I want you to think of the NAD as the wheelbarrow and the hydrogens and electrons are its cargo. So if you can remember that the NAD is the wheelbarrow, the hydrogens and electrons are what are being carried, it'll help you understand the process. Oxygen is not needed for this step, so it's called anaerobic. Now, this is the beginning stage of either aerobic or anaerobic, but oxygen is not required. Okay, this shows, this is from a different book, but it basically shows you this process. This will not be an essay. So here's our glucose. Notice that you have to invest two ATP here, basically put energy in. So if you know the expression, it takes money to make money, well, it takes ATP to make ATP. So you actually use up a little bit of ATP to start the process. Notice we have two NADHs here and here, one each, being filled with hydrogen and energy. Notice the sunburst shape means that there's energy in there. This is going over all the way to the end to electron transport. Now, at the end of the glycolysis, notice that the discharged ADP becomes energy filled ATP. You get two of them here and two of them here. So why is it that they say you only get two? Well, think about profit. If it costs you two things, but you make you sell it for four things, you've made two. So it costs two, you sold for four, your net profits two. So since it cost you two at the beginning, you get four at the end, the net at the end is two. So it's not very much. So notice it here, it's the energy harvest phase, and this is the energy investment phase. So you have to put energy in, then you get energy out. This is direct ATP, this is gonna be used later. Okay, this is the what is called the Krebs cycle prep stage. And what we're seeing here is that pyruvic acid from the previous stage is gonna shed a carbon dioxide. 
Now, please make a note. This is a review question and a test question. It says, in what form or molecule are all the carbon atoms removed from the original glucose? And the answer is carbon dioxide. See these little dark gray circles? This is carbon dioxide, and this is how carbon from the original sugar is leaving. This goes to your lungs and then out, out of your lungs through your mouth, and you breathe it out. All of the CO2 is going to be coming off and leaving that way. So now we have acetic acid when the CO2 comes off. Now look at this. NAD, which is an empty wheelbarrow, becomes NADH, which is a full wheelbarrow. So NAD picks up a hydrogen and electron, giving it energy. Coenzyme A comes in and connects to acetic acid, making acetyl-CoA. So see acetyl-CoA. You mix it together and you make acetyl-coenzyme A. Now this is going to go directly into the Krebs cycle. So in this prep stage, carbon dioxide leaves. A wheelbarrow is filled up. This is going to head over to ETS. Coenzyme A is added and a CO2 leaves. Okay, Krebs cycle. Now the pyruvate that we saw right here, pyruvic acid, remember pyruvic acid and pyruvate are the same thing? So pyruvic acid enters the mitochondria. One carbon is removed to CO2, I showed you in the previous picture. The pyruvate becomes the two carbon acetyl-CoA when it picks up coenzyme A. NADH is formed to carry hydrogen atoms to the last stage called ETS. The acetyl-CoA attaches to a four carbon molecule, which I haven't shown you yet making a new six carbon molecule. This new six carbon molecule is called citric acid. Yes, it's the same citric acid you find in lemons and oranges. And that's why sometimes the cycle is called the citric acid cycle, not the Krebs cycle. So either one is correct. Another carbon is carbon dioxide. Remember that all of the carbons are leaving as CO2. It's removed, making a five carbon molecule. You don't need to know what it is. Another hydrogen carrier is formed, NADH is formed for later. Remember, these are all going to ETS to make ATP. This step happens one more time, taking you back to four carbons, releasing another carbon dioxide and making one more NADH, another wheelbarrow full of hydrogens and electrons. One molecule of ATP is then formed. Now notice, one molecule is not very much. This is a bonus. This is not the main point of Krebs cycle. Now, when I ask you, what is the main point of Krebs cycle? you should be seeing something happening over and over again, and that's these NADHs. So the main point of Krebs cycle is not to make ATP directly, is to fill up these NAD wheelbarrows with hydrogens and electrons to send on to ETS. So NADH, NADH, and then we saw NADH up here. Now, what's interesting is we do it again, make another NADH, but we also do what is called a double wheelbarrow, FADH2. Notice two hydrogens are carried here. So it carries two hydrogens, two electrons, so it's double. No one knows why it's different, but it works. And so all the way from uh, protists, which are like paramecia, all the way to us, us do it the same way, so it works. Okay, so now when you have these last two hydrogen carriers, the original four carbon molecule is recycled back up to the top right here. So it's a cycle. So if you look, this is a figure from your book here. It's not showing you the molecules coming in, but it's showing you what is happening in terms of the energy. Three NAD are becoming to uh, three NAD are becoming three NADH. So it happens at various places along the circle, but they are summarizing it right here. There's this double wheelbar. FAD becomes FADH2. Two carbon dioxides come off. You make a molecule of ATP, and this comes in acetyl CoA comes in dropping off the carbon. So this is not my favorite figure, but it is from your book. So there you go. Okay, this is another way to show it. There's the acetic acid coming in after the prep stage. And what comes out is carbon dioxide. So all the little black circles are carbon dioxide. Remember, this is the former molecule that all the carbons from the original glucose uh, leave. So even acetic acid is a piece of the original glucose. So we, if we have ADP and phosphate, what do they become? Well, they become ATP. What do these empty wheelbarrows become? They become full wheelbarrows. And this one double wheelbarrow becomes FADH2. So this is another way to summarize what we saw on the previous page. Okay, so explaining Krebs cycle. The two carbons of the acetic acid that came into the mitochondria are released as carbon dioxide, showed it in the previous figure. Five hydrogens become attached to five hydrogen carriers, this form. 
It's actually six hydrogens, but close enough. One ATP is generated. Remember, this is not the main function of Krebs. This is a bonus. Okay, ETS. This is where most of the energy is going to be made. Most of the ATP energy is going to be made. So it's made here. Now, this figure shows how water can be used to lift a bucket. We're going to be seeing how something flowing, moving, can cause an action. All of the NADH and FADH, remember, most of these came from Krebs cycle, and FADH came from Krebs cycle. They reach the ETS, or electron transport system, sometimes called the electron transport chain, and they dump, dump the hydrogens that they're carrying, and they dump electrons. When this happens, the electrons that were in the bonds move through the protein chain called the electron transport system or the electron transport chain. That's why it's called the electron transport system, because it's transporting electrons. The moving electrons cause hydrogens to be pumped through the membrane against the gradient. Now, if you remember, we talked about what diffusion and osmosis are. Well, osmosis, diffusion, let's go to diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of particles from high concentration to low. Now, if you're going against the gradient, it means it's going against diffusion, and it means it requires energy. Where does it get the energy to do this? From the electrons that are moving through this chain, and I'll show you in a picture. As the hydrogens move back through the membrane, now we have a whole bunch of hydrogens on one side, very little on the other. When they come back through, through the process of diffusion, you get 32 ATPs. And that's the whole point of this whole thing, is to get these 32 ATPs per original glucose form. The moving electrons and free hydrogens have to go somewhere. And they end up hooking up with oxygen that you breathe to form water. So if anybody ever asks you, including me, why do we breathe oxygen? The answer is not to stay alive. The answer is to give the electrons a place to end up. Now, let me explain how this works. In a battery, why do you have to connect both sides of the battery? Well, it's because the electrons come out of, if you ever look at a battery, the electrons come out of the negative end. The end has a minus sign. They go through your device. Let's say it's a remote control. Then they have to have somewhere to go. So when you connect the positive end of the battery, which is the little nipple end, that gives the electrons a place to go. And if you only connect one side, you're not gonna have anything happen because the electrons have to go through the device and back into the battery. Now, the oxygen and the hydrogen in there represent the positive end of the battery, a place for electrons to go. Because if electrons have nowhere to go, they can't keep flowing. If they can't flow, they can't pump hydrogens. You can't pump hydrogens, you can't make ATP. Without ATP, you're dead. So the point of this whole thing is making ATP so you can stay alive. Now, let's take a look at this figure. This figure is not in your book, but it is one that I'm going to be asking you about on the test. So you need to take really good notes here. Okay, I'm going to start this very slow. Remember, you can pause and rewind me and pay, take better notes. So we're going to start at step one. Here is one of these electron carriers. Notice these two minus symbols represent electrons. So the NADH is carrying a hydrogen right here, and it's carrying two electrons. Now notice, when it goes over here, what is it lost? Well, it's lost its hydrogen and the two electrons. The two electrons go up here where it says electron flow, and they start going through this biological wire, which are proteins. The hydrogen goes right down here. You see all these hydrogens here? This is what was dropped off. Now, I'm going to focus on the electrons to start. Then we're going to focus on the hydrogen. Notice the electrons are this orange line. Here at step two, the FADH2, which also came from Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, that drops off its two hydrogens, which are all down here, and these two electrons, and that joins this electron flow. Now the key, what is the point of moving electrons along here? Well, it works like electricity. If you move electricity through a pump, what can you move? Water. In this case, we're not moving water, we're moving hydrogens. Now notice, there's very few hydrogens down here and lots up above. If you want the hydrogens to go the way that they don't want to go, which is up, or where it's already crowded, you have to add energy, in this case, electrons. So it's almost like a little microscopic pump, pumping hydrogen ions or protons from where there's less to where there's more. So now the point of all these electrons sliding through here is you're taking the hydrogens that were dropped off by NADH and FADH2 down here and moving them to this side of the membrane. So what's the point of that? 
Now we have a whole bunch of hydrogens that can move and do work. So we're gonna go over to step four. We're gonna follow the electrons. So at step three, now we have tons of hydrogens on this side, very few on this side, and they're being pumped against the gradient to the other side of the membrane. So these electrons, remember I said batteries, electrons have to have a place to go. What is the skull and crossbones? I'll tell you in a moment. The electrons have to have somewhere to go in order so that they can continue to flow, pump hydrogen. Where they go is with oxygen, but the oxygen can't hold it by itself. It has to combine with hydrogen. Now, remember I told you you make water in your body? That's because when you take oxygen that you breathe in, plus the hydrogens that are floating around down here, you make water. And what that does is allows the electrons to continue to flow, a place for the electrons to go. So now more electrons can follow behind. Now, what does the skull and crossbones mean? It means that if you don't breathe oxygen for long enough, the electrons stop flowing, you stop pumping these hydrogens up here, and you can't do this all important last step, which is making ATP. So if you don't breathe oxygen, you die. That's where that skull and crossbow comes in. So we used oxygen and the hydrogens to make water, giving the electrons a place to end up so that we can continue to flow them. Now let's go up to step five. If you remember I said, since we've been pumping hydrogens with these electrons, we have a whole bunch here. Now in regular diffusion, Molecules want to go, or ions, in this case ions or protons, want to go from where it's crowded to where it's less crowded. Where, how does it do that? Well, it goes through a thing called ATP synthase. So this purple kind of, kind of light bulb shaped structure is called ATP synthase. That means it's an enzyme that synthesizes ATP. So how does it work? When the hydrogens flow from high concentration to low, just through regular diffusion, this whole molecule rotates like a wheel makes it turn. This turning molecule causes the discharged ADP and phosphate that you discharge by flexing your muscles and makes it into ATP. Now you have hydrogen in here that is eventually going to get pumped out again or used to make water. So the whole point was by pumping hydrogen, it allows the hydrogens now to come back through here, rotate this molecule, and that converts this discharged ADP and phosphate, dead battery, to ATP, a charged up battery, and this is how we stay alive. So you got to go through all those steps. Where did we get the electrons from? Here. Where did we get these from? Krebs cycle and glycolysis. So this is a lot to process, I realize. I would recommend, if I were you, doing one sentence at least for each of the steps. You can combine steps one and two because they're basically just these hydrogen and electron carriers dropping off their electrons and their hydrogens. But step three, you should mention in a sentence. Step four, you should mention in a sentence. Step five, you should mention the sentence. This is the flowing hydrogens. And step six, the rotating ATP synthase enzyme making ATP. You guys can get this. Remember, do not use the internet and copy something. Talk about what I talked about today and use the analogies to give you more detail. Okay, this figure shows how different types of food molecules all enter respiration at different points. Now, I talked about sugars, right? Glucose, going through glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electron transport. But we don't eat just glucose, do we? We eat other kinds of starches, other kinds of sugars. We eat fats, which are broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. We also eat proteins, which are broken down to amino acids. All of these basic molecules enter these different step, steps at different places where they're converted from amino acids, fatty acids, et cetera, into something that can enter this process. So all the food molecules that we eat are used to make energy. Okay, this is another overview showing how much in each step it is. This will not be on the test. Just a quick summary, kind of, re, kind of restating and summarize what I've been talking to you about. Okay, that is it for today. Nobody's here because I'm recording this myself. So uh, I hope this made sense. If you have any questions, please, email me or see me in class. Please remember folks that uh, there was no lab this week because of, uh, of Labor Day, but I will see you the following Monday uh, for lab. And you can ask me questions about this then, or uh, you can ask me about it uh, through email. Anyway, have a good day, guys. We'll see you next time.